I want to teach you one of my most valuable data analysis techniques. I've used this particular technique many times, both as an employee when I worked for companies and now as an independent consultant with my clients. And it has delighted leaders time and time again. This is a universal skill that once you learn it, you can apply it over and over again throughout your career. The best part of this whole technique is that it's relatively straightforward. All you're doing is taking a couple of the most useful machine learning techniques, k-means clustering and decision trees, and putting them together. Honestly, you can learn how to do this if you'd like. For example, I have some free machine learning crash courses down below the video in the description. These free crash courses are a great way for you to start your journey if you're interested in supercharging your analytics. By the way, before I get started with the video, I should mention that if you've watched my YouTube video on cluster analysis with Python and Excel already, you may want to skip ahead in the video to the chapter on training the machine learning model. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started with this video by setting the context by looking at the data. So as you can see, I'm in Microsoft Excel and I have some data here. And this data happens to represent the behavior of grocery store customers. And the fact that this is grocery store data isn't actually the interesting part of this video. What's interesting about it is, is that this particular data set represents a general class of data that is universal across all kinds of fields, healthcare, government, you name it. When your data is set up where every row is a thing of interest, where you can see here, these are individual grocery store customers, but they could be patients if you work in healthcare, they could be unemployment insurance claims if you work in government, and then the columns are some sort of measurement. They could be measurement of behavior in terms of money spent or counts of things done or whatever it might be, or it might be numeric measurements of some attribute of the thing of interest. For example, you can see here that we have income. So we have the income levels of all of our grocery store clients. And then of course, things like their wine purchases and their fish product purchases, so on and so forth. Notice that all of these columns are numeric. When you first get started with this technique, make sure you're only using numeric quantities, numeric columns. So counts, characteristics, sums, that sort of thing. As long as you've got that data, you're cool. And what you can do is you can actually mine this data. You can use clustering to actually extract patterns out of the data, groups out of the data, and this is super interesting. So for example, groups of grocery store customers, groups of patients if you work in healthcare, groups of folks that are filing for unemployment insurance if you work in government, so on and so forth. Then what you can do is after you've clustered this data, you can then understand what attributes, what characteristics actually predominantly drove the items of interest, the rows, to be in one cluster or another. And that's a little bit abstract. So let's go ahead and actually see this in practice so you can see what's going on. So let's go ahead and move over to the Python code. And what we're gonna do here is just go through some code. And I'm not gonna explain it in super levels of detail. As I mentioned before, I have some machine learning crash courses that you can look at in the description below the video if you wanna learn more details. So what I'll do is I will show you the general technique by copying and pasting in Python code and just explaining it to you very quickly how it all works. So first up, what we're going to do is we need to load the data from our Excel table into Python. And by the way, just so you know, one of the best practices for using Python and Excel is to use Excel tables. Make sure your tables have column names, make sure that all the columns are formatted correctly. And if you're doing that, then everything should flow pretty smoothly from Excel into Python. So how we get started with Python and Excel is equals PY. This is our function. This is our conduit to switch into Python mode. And you'll notice now that my cell has a little PY and it's green. So let me just expand this a little bit. And I'm gonna go ahead and paste some code in here. And what we've got here is the brand new Excel function. This comes with Python and Excel. If you don't have access to Python and Excel right now, you're not gonna have either the PY or the Excel function, just so you know. You have to request access from Microsoft and it takes them a while to give it to you. So the Excel function is your gateway. It provides your Python code the ability to access various data sources in your Excel workbook. And we can see this right here. I'm loading up my customer behaviors table with all of my columns. And I'm telling the Excel function that my table has headers. But I can also use the Excel function to source data from Power Query. And I'm gonna have a future video demonstrating how you do that. But for right now, we're just gonna use the Excel table. So this function says, look, go grab all of the data, including the headers from the customer behaviors Excel table, and then store it in something called customers underscore behaviors. This is what's known as a data frame in Python. And a data frame is just a representation of an entire table of data. 
and I've just given it a name using a standard Python naming convention here of logical words, all lowercase, separated by an underscore. Now, if I run this code by clicking Control Enter, see that right here, Control Enter, this code is actually gonna go run in the Microsoft Cloud because Python in Excel actually runs in Microsoft Azure, which is their cloud solution, not locally on your computer. And that came back and I got my data frame. If I click on the card here, I can get a preview of what's going on with my data frame. Oh, wow, that's not very good. Let's go ahead and shrink this up a little bit here. There we go. <laughs> and we expand it out. And what you can see here is a preview of my data frame. So I have my income variable, my income column of data, various aspects of my behaviors of my grocery store customers, so on and so forth. So I've got my data loaded in a data frame. And now that I have that, I can do interesting things with it. So one of the first things that I need to do is actually transform my numeric columns, because let me click on this card again, just to show you what I'm talking about here. If you recall, the income column is actually quite large. The values in it are quite large. They're all like five figures, like 58,000, 46,000, 71,000. So they're much larger than these other count-based features. And this will cause problems when you're doing clustering using a technique that we're going to use in this video called k-means, which is a very, very useful clustering technique, by the way. K-means isn't like this. So what we need to do is put these guys on equal footing. This is what's known as scaling the data. So what we're going to do here is scale the data. And I'm going to go ahead and paste some code in here. And what this is doing is creating what's known as a standard scalar object in Python. This object, this class, provides the functionality for putting all of our data, all of our numeric data, on equal footing so it works really well with the k-means clustering technique. And here's all the code here. I create my scaler. I then ask it to learn what it needs to do and then transform my data so that it is now scaled. And what I'm doing is I'm taking the original data frame, which is not changed by this, by the way. The original data stays clean and pristine. And then what I get back is a new object a matrix technically of the scaled data. And then what I do is I just make it into a formal data frame. And this is then saying, look, just look at the first 10 rows. Now, if I go ahead and run this, it'll take a second. And if I click on the card for this particular data frame, look what's happened. The data has been scaled. Notice that the income numbers are all around the same magnitude as the other columns. Yes, some of them are positive and some of them are negative. That actually doesn't matter for our purposes. It's totally okay. Notice that everything's on equal footing. Income is no longer 58,000, 71,000. It's all numbers that look very similar to all the rest of the columns. And that's exactly what we want. Okay, moving on. What we're going to do next here is we're going to go ahead and now cluster the data using the k-means technique, also known as an algorithm. So once again, I'm going to go ahead and do my PY here to get into Python editor mode paste in my code, and you can see here what I'm doing is importing a class from Python called k-means, which is nice because that's exactly the technique we're using. They're named the same thing. <laughs> I love it when everything's intuitive. And what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, we would like to perform the k-means clustering process, please. And what we'd like to do is find three clusters. When you use k-means, you have to tell it up front how many clusters, how many groups it needs to find in your data. And there are various techniques for actually determining what that value should be. And by the way, the K in K-means actually means the number of clusters. So here the K equals three. And what I did was I used a couple of techniques behind the scenes before recording this video to actually find that three is relatively optimal. It's a good choice for this data. Now, the problem with K-means is that once you've picked the number of clusters, it starts the process in various random places in the data. And sometimes if it starts in a bad place, you don't get a very good clustering. So what we do is we say, okay, hey, why don't you go repeat the process of clustering a bunch of times and then give me back the best of all of your attempts. So that's what I'm doing here. So I'm saying, okay, do 50 runs, do 50 clusterings and only return me back the best clustering, please. And the random state here just allows you and me to see the same thing over and over again. And then we go ahead and ask the k-means class to do the work. And then what we get back are a bunch of labels. And let me just run this code and show you what you get back. So what you get back here is an ND array. We don't really care what that means. If we click on this card here, what we can see here is zeros, ones, and twos. Because Python starts counting at zero, we have cluster assignments of zero, one, and two, or three total clusters. And what we can see here is that row, the first row, was assigned to cluster zero. The second row was assigned to cluster two. 
the third row was assigned to cluster one, so on and so forth. And we can see here that we had 2,205 individual values because that's how many rows of data we have. So we've now clustered our data. And that's great, but the question then becomes, how do we characterize the clusters? How do we analyze them and understand the commonalities that put customer 37 into cluster zero versus customer 1,333 into cluster two? And what we're going to do to actually help us understand and analyze our clusters is using a machine learning model, in particular, a decision tree. So let's see how we can do that. Eagles PY, open parenthesis, paste in my code, check this out. What I'm doing here is I'm importing a very particular type of class in Python, which is known as a decision tree classifier. This is a machine learning model that will learn how to predict the cluster assignments from the original data values, from the original customer behavior data. And what we can see here is I'm starting up my decision tree classifier. I'm creating it, also known as instantiating it. And I'm saying, look, make me a tree, please, that learns how to predict the cluster labels, but my tree can only be three levels deep. And I pick this after doing some optimization exercises offline. This is a reasonable value for the sake of this video. Is it the best value? No, not really. But it produces a tree that suits my nefarious purposes. <laughs> So we're going to make a tree that's three levels deep, and we'll learn how to predict our labels. And what we can see here is this line of code actually does it. It says, look, fit means go learn. Hey, decision tree, go learn from the customer behaviors. This is my original data, not scaled, right? The original values like income of 51,000, so on and so forth. Learn from this data how to predict the labels. So if I run this code, nothing super exciting really happens. I get back my model, but I actually need to actually understand what the model's doing so I can interpret it. First up, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, look, is the model actually any good? That is, does the decision tree actually accurately predict the label assignments, the cluster label assignments? If it does, then it might be a useful model for me to interpret the clusters. So the easiest way for me to do that is to use something known as a confusion matrix. I'm not going to drain this code. What's more important is actually seeing what it's going to do. So what I need to do is change the output of this cell to be an Excel value, not a Python value, but an Excel value. And if I run this, what I'll get back is a teeny tiny little image of my confusion matrix. Now what I can do here is make this a lot bigger, this cell a lot bigger. On the Y axis, are my actual cluster assignments. Cluster zero, cluster one, cluster two. And here are the labels that are predicted by my decision tree machine learning model, zero, one, and two. And along the diagonal here are the predictions that are correct. My model predicted cluster assignment two when in fact the actual cluster assignment is two. And what we can use this for is to understand overall, how good is our model in terms of understanding and predicting the cluster labels? How good is it at interpreting the underlying patterns of the clusters? And what we can see here, for example, on this row, is that it got 989 correct and only 29 wrong. This one, 541 correct, 60 wrong, 506 correct, 80 wrong. So at first blush, this is not a bad model. Actually, it's a little over 90, I think it's around 92% accurate overall. So with that being said, let's go ahead and visualize the decision tree because that's gonna be critical for us to actually start to understand what's going on in our clustering. So equals PY, paste the code, go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. Again, I'm not gonna drain the code. Just notice here that I had to make the visual relatively large because the tree is actually kind of wide. It's not very tall, but it's wide. So to make this work, I needed to set the visual to be 20 inches by eight inches. And what I'm gonna do once again is switch over the output from a Python object to an Excel object. So when I run this, I'll actually get the image embedded in my cell. And you can see your teeny tiny image of our decision tree. So let's go ahead and make this bigger because that makes it a lot easier to understand what's going on. So what we can see here is a decision tree that is around, like I said earlier, around 92% accurate in terms of predicting the cluster assignments. And what this allows you to do is start to understand the underlying patterns in the data and start crafting a story about what's going on with, for example, your grocery store customers, or it could be patients or unemployment insurance claims, whatever it might be. 
Now, here's the thing. Generally speaking, you don't want to necessarily show this image directly to your end stakeholders. What you want to do is actually interpret it yourself and then build a verbal or written data story that just talks about the underlying patterns at a high level. And let me show you what I mean by this. So first up, what we can see here is that we have three main colors and the colors are actually associated with the cluster assignments, the cluster labels. So for example, green is associated with cluster label one, because you can see right here, zero, three, and zero. This is the second position, which since Python starts counting at zero, means that this is cluster assignment one. Purple, on the other hand, notice it's 967. Purple is actually, assi is actually associated with cluster assignment two, zero, one, two. And then lastly, the orange color is cluster one. You can see 425 here, so cluster one. Now with that background, we can start to think about characterizing what's going on with the clustering vis-a-vis -vis the original data values. So first up, what we can see here is that our tree says, look, I'm gonna split the data. I'm gonna segment the data. I'm gonna segment the customers based on total food purchases. So every customer who has total food purchases less than or equal to 277.5 goes down the left side of the tree. You might wanna characterize this in terms of your data story as casual customers, maybe customers that don't frequent your store very often. They don't actually go buy the bulk of their groceries from you and they flow down here. And then what we can quickly see is that this first node here, it's overwhelmingly purple, right? Notice we have 038996. This means out of the original data, more than a thousand rows came here, 1,034 rows came down here and the most of these rows were assigned to cluster two. So cluster two is predominantly about folks with low total food purchases. And then what we can see here is that we can get a little bit more fine grain. Essentially what this is doing is trying to find some exceptions for you. And what we can see here is that we have a few exceptions around this idea of cluster one. So we have seven here for cluster one, three for cluster one, zero, and 28. But in general, what we can characterize cluster two as is customers that have low total food purchases. Now, moving over to the right side of the tree, these are people with high levels of food purchases, let's say. And then the next question is, yeah, they buy a lot from us, but do they buy a lot of meat? Because you can see here, the next rule is meat product purchases less than or equal to 249.5. So these are low meat purchases and these are high meat purchases. And what we can see here, right at this level of the tree is that this is predominantly green or cluster one, and this is predominantly orange or cluster zero. So what we can see here is that orange is predominantly people who buy a lot of food purchases, and in particular, they buy a lot of meat products. And that's how you can start using this decision tree model to understand your clustering and start providing insights. And I have used this particular technique over and over again throughout my career to find new and interesting insights and then communicate them in an intuitive way to stakeholders. Once again, I usually don't use the actual decision tree diagram. I create a data story, a narrative based on it that folks can easily understand. There you have it, a quick demonstration of very powerful analytics made possible with Python and Excel. As much as a game changer as Python and Excel is, it's not designed for every Microsoft Excel user. Python and Excel is designed for Excel users, for professionals that want to differentiate themselves at work by providing analytical insights that just are not possible with out-of-the-box Excel features. For example, in my next video, I'm gonna demonstrate how to conduct a logistic regression analysis and then tell you how you can use the results of that analysis to communicate new and powerful insights to your stakeholders. And what will be interesting about this video is, is that you can build logistic regression models in Excel, even before Python and Excel was a thing. However, it's a pain and it's error prone. So what I will show you is both the old way of doing logistic regression and the new way with Python and Excel. And you can see for yourself how much better it is with Python and Excel. So when that video is ready, I'll go ahead and put a tile up here on the screen for you to click on to go watch that video. And in the meantime, what I'll do is put up another one of my Python and Excel videos that you might find interesting. So that's it for this time. Please stay healthy and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.